on uh, cost. The house actually consumes less. And now this is the important part, for its lifespan, not our lifespan. I, I often feel like uh, I'm the milkman that someone's going to come out and see the bin and, and just get a smile on their face. Welcome to the second season of The Green Screen. I'm your host, Bill Rogers, and we're going to be continuing with 13 more weeks dedicated to the solutions that are all around us, to solutions that save. Join us here each week and on our website, thegreenscreen.tv, where you can see full episodes, uh, more links to our sponsors, links to the programming that you're making, and uh, also visit our Facebook site, The Green Screen. And there, as well as our website, you can send us your ideas, the stories you'd like us to cover, the stories that you're finding in your own backyard. The Greenscreen.tv is brought to you by the Sea Solar Store, the GES Solar Store, the Green Energy Options Solar Store, MJW Drywall, and New Hampshire Insulation.com, EarthTech, Ridgeview Construction, and the Green Alliance. I'm your host, Bill Rogers, and for the next 13 weeks, we'll be looking at and for solutions, solutions that save. Today's show is all about waste busting, and our first solution comes from nhinsulation.com, part of MJW Drywall and one of our sponsors. Mike Wilson brought waste busting close to home, my own home, in fact. Mike's nhinsulation.com specializes in spray and injection foam that helps homeowners and businesses reduce their heating bills. So what is spray foam insulation? Well, it's this stuff, and this stuff, and this stuff. And it's all designed to better insulate these things, our homes. After an energy audit of our own home, it became very clear that we had, as far as insulation is concerned, a few gaps to fill. Enter Mike Wilson. He's the one responsible for putting that cool futuristic spray foam insulation stuff in our house. Definitely see some changes after this one. Yeah, yeah, you could. So, so what did you find when you started opening up the walls here? A lot of empty cavities, a lot of loose cellulose that had settled, a lot of gaps. Um, I'd say maybe 16 to a third, not even insulated. Wow. Wow. So that's so that that's that's why it's been a little drafty. Uh, a little a little drafty at yeah. times, yeah. And drafty isn't just uncomfortable, it's wasteful. A poorly insulated home can waste up to 60% of the energy used to heat it. That means we're throwing away a lot of money right out the window. So at our house, we went ahead and upgraded our home's insulation from the ground up. Well, the first thing we did is when we spray foam the basement, we actually spray foam the floor in here to help stop any draft from coming through the, the brick and up through the basement into that area because it'll use your drafty from that. Yeah. The second step is good to look at how we're gonna get access to this because obviously we have no clap siding here that we can remove and it's not a good idea to drill holes directly through the siding because that will leave a spot that moisture can get into over time and cause rot and mildew and all the other fun stuff that goes along with that. So we have two options. We can try to take some of the trim boards off and try to fill it that way, or we can go through the interior and try to drill holes through the sheetrock or the plaster and fill it from the inside and patch them after. Uh -huh. So it's, it's going to be really dependent on what the homeowner wants to do. For our house, Mike recommended going at the walls with injection foam from the outside. Lesser of two evils. I mean, obviously doing it from the inside, now you have interior work that has to be done, clean up, uh, furniture has to be moved out of the way. You know, working inside the house is always the last option. Yeah. Obviously, you try to do everything in the exterior. That way, it's less invasive on the homeowner. Good. Okay, so that's what we'll do. We'll do the outside uh, from the outside in. So, I don't know. Do you have to pull something, or do you just can you just drill a, a, a plug, drill a hole? Well, it, our first choice is always to try to take something off if we can. That way, it's less noticeable. We can make it more watertight and, and do it correctly. Yeah. Um, in certain areas, we have multiple trim pieces like we have here. Um, a lot of times going through the flat board is going to be the only option, you know, because you get into something that's 90, 100 years old, and you start taking trim boards off that have been sitting here for a long time that you can't actually get, you know, hand-hewed lumber anymore that's going to match that detail yeah. at the lumber yard. So you're going to end up by destroying it in the first place, so you're better off just to drill holes in the, the flat area. Yeah. Now, when you guys start 
injecting the foam. That's one of the next step for this. Or, yes. Uh, will you put the, uh, the the wall boards back in and then go through a plug, or will you just go through your openings here and then put the wall board on, on top of the foam? Do you have like this where you have to actually take the, the original boards off to oh, access yeah. the cavity to vacuum it out? Yeah. It's just easier and less time consuming oh, yeah. to mm -hmm. go right up the, the wall with that opening. And you can literally just build this up and come right past, put your board in, squish it in, and nail it down. Ah, good. So, so that, that makes it an easier thing. You can. It does. It's going to cut the labor cost down for yep. both the homeowner and for us. Um, and it's going to get the same result either way. So while Mike Wilson and his crew went about beefing up my own home's insulation with goo that looks like it came out of the Stave Puff Marshmallow Man, I had to wonder, is it safe? In the basement, we used a dense closed cell foam made by Geico Western. In the exterior walls, we used a light open cell foam made by Tripolymer. And in the attic, another form of spray foam that made it look like we were covered with clouds. I went through the research of all the different products. Uh, the other products are powder-based. They come out of the Ukraine, and they are urea formaldehyde-based products. And urea formaldehyde was banned in the 80s. Um, Tripolymer is a phenolic formaldehyde, which is equivalent to a head of lettuce in phenolic formaldehyde, so it's very safe compared to the other products that were causing uh, lung and breathing issues in young children, older people, and people with asthma and emphysema. So we're on the safer side of spray foam, but was it worth all that time and expense? How much are we going to save now that our home has been slathered with foam? The overall performance characteristics of the foam is far outweighs any of the uh, the aggravation, in my opinion. Yeah. The savings typically is 20 to 40 percent higher than other options. 20 to 40 percent over compared to like if we'd put cellulose in this, filled in more cellulose down here. Yep. Yeah. I think this was by far the best option you guys could have gone with. Um, you know, obviously doing the roof line, in my opinion, is the best scenario. And doing the injection foam in the wall, which is basically doubling the R value of what you had there, um, you're going to see a huge savings in air reduction. I think this whole house is going to see significant savings on fuel and on uh, cost. And that's what we're all about here at the green screen. Solutions that save. We'll be right back. our membership in the Green Alliance. It allows us to buy green, buy local, and save lots of money. My mom likes the discount, and I like the cake. Stores like the old time hardware store. Come check it out. When I was a kid, my dad took me through this great place where you could find just about any little gadget to do just about anything. These glass tubes are called heat pipes. The sun comes out, starts making steam, things get hot, showers get warm. What we're doing is we're bringing solar to Main Street. So are we on Main Street here? Well, this isn't exactly Main Street. We're on Route 108 north of the Weeks Crossing. In Dover, just, it's a great place where you can come and learn about how you can save energy by using the sun. Before the break, we looked at a solution to save homeowners money with better insulation. But what about those of us getting ready to build a house? Wouldn't it make sense to engineer those savings into our homes from the very beginning? Well, that's just what our next Waste Buster is all about. Shane Carter and his company Ridgeview Construction create award-winning sustainable homes that save energy by consuming less. We caught up with Shane on the worksite of a home that incorporates solutions of all kinds. Today we are in beautiful Derry, New Hampshire, uh, in uh, a very wooded parcel, um, and we're building a, a really cool timber peg Ridgeview hybrid home, uh, timber frame hybrid home. Timber framing is neat in the sense that it's very process oriented. You know, A begets C begets D, and there's no skipping it. So you get to start with the bottom, the bottom timbers, and move all the way up, um, and it's a, it's a simple. Uh, 
And it's, it's one of those cathartic building processes, you know, where it's not bound up by technology. It's, you know, you're, you know, you have you know, your tenon cuts and your mortises and everything goes together. You drive a, tim you know, a, a, you know, a, a tree nail, a trunnel through that and, you know, that makes the connection. And although the assembly on site of a timber frame home is not bound up by technology, back in the mill where these particular sections came from, precision computer controlled machines were used to reduce the amount of waste produced in the cutting process. We deliver uh, the most sustainable buildings we can and communities for, for people here in New Hampshire, and Maine, and Massachusetts. But sustainable buildings aren't just about gadgets and doodads. Some of the features in this house are engineered to save energy simply by being incorporated into the design of the home. It's an idea called passive design. So here's, here's a, a good example. This is, this is, a, this is a south face of the house. And so we, we put up these, um, these solar shading elements, the, these little roof lines here, because in, in, the, in the peak of the summer, this house would overheat if we didn't have some shading and some way to, to get that, that heat to not come in. So these roof lines are set at the right angle and at the right depth off of the house to, uh, to stop the sun from, from penetrating the, uh, the glazing there. But still in the winter months when the sun is lower in the aspect on the horizon, it still allows the, the sun to get in and get some passive, uh, passive solar gain that way when the house needs it in the winter. Um, so that's a pretty cool element. Uh, a passive house uses 10% of the energy of a house built to typical code today. Mm. And that's just tremendous. So just a Not 10% less, but 10% of one tenth. one tenth of what a, a normal home built today would use. Not even the, the homes that we all live in that built in the 1900s or 1800s. Um, so that's a, that's a tremendous concept. And the, the thought process is put a lot of your budget and a lot of your energy into really air sealing and creating a super insulated shell and offset that uh, by having such a lower heat demand and lower consumption in the house that you're really working, uh, you're, you're not consuming, you're, you're, you are much more passive in that way and that you're, uh, you're, not, uh, you're not using resources as much. And uh, it's very easy to heat and cool a home that way in terms of uh, the energy you would need to do that. And, uh, and hopefully in, in, if it's designed properly, it would even be much less in terms of the water consumption as well as the electricity consumption there. The house actually consumes less, and now this is the important part, for its lifespan, not our lifespan. Uh, all these houses we build should be around for hundreds of years, and uh, I'm pretty sure I won't be, but, <laughs> yeah. but, but these houses will be. And so what the energy these houses use in their lifespan is very important. It's a, it's a huge impact, really, for all of our built environment. Here in New Hampshire, where the residential sector is one of the largest consumers of energy, thinking green and building green sustainable homes makes a lot of sense, but it wasn't always a priority. And Fifteen years ago, we weren't, we weren't talking green, you know, I mean, you know uh, at all. The conversation, you know, I mean, really, with the exception of a few very particular niche markets, it wasn't, it wasn't a conversation we were having yet. Um, you know, it really, I think it started with just, uh, you know, trying to, you know, insulate houses and seal houses. I think that's where a lot of it really started to come from. Um, and then, you know, moves into cost effectiveness and then, you know, be able to take that uh, the next step, you know, with Energy Star labels or, you know, the, the, lead, uh, uh, the lead certifications and whatnot. Um, you know, it's neat, it's just, you know, seeing what out there, again, it's just like, you know, how much, you know, we, we can do, you know, being able to, you know, value engineer things by being able to use, you know, drawing upon our own construction experience, whatnot. A good example of value engineering is the way Shane works with the land to preserve each work site's natural resources. Incorporating each lot's natural features into the design of the home is a solution that can save both money and energy. We really worked with the natural topography. This, this land had a, a great slope to it. The clients happened to want uh, a walkout basement uh, so that they could have a finished basement. So we helped them select this particular lot and, and develop it and, and build on it so that it, it met their needs with, while working with the land as much as possible. Um, it also coincidentally happened to have the right slope and grade of the land to a, a beautiful solar south orientation. Uh, so that we're able to take advantage of uh, passive solar elements in this house as well and really hopefully offset a little bit of their uh, BTU needs and, uh, and heating demand in the home. Uh, so that's, that's sort of how we try to work with 
natural resources as much as possible in the land. Shainton has degrees in forestry and environmental sciences. He says he likes to bring an environmental sensitivity to the construction process. Often, that means taking the time to get to know a site. This was so dense and so thick and so overgrown. And, you know, we came in here and I was flagging all the trees and, and, and seeing what we're going to choose to keep. And, you know, we're keeping these little birch trees over here. And we got this cool little, this, this huge, actually, uh, Russian olive that, you know, if you were to go to buy that at a nursery would be, I don't know how much, but a lot of money. And we're able to leave that here just by identifying it in the, in the land clearing process and saying, oh, wow, that's cool. Let's keep that. That's another feature we found over here is this, uh, this old um, uh, chimney from an old homestead. And uh, just in the deep of the woods, you, you couldn't, this was so thick in here, you couldn't see it. Ah. And uh, on the side of it there, there is a little opening. So that was the chimney to probably a very, very old, for 1700s, definitely 18th century, I would say. Uh, and uh, they've, they've just been abandoned long ago, but it's a cool feature along with these old stone walls that were, you know, just in the middle of the forest. So we try and keep really neat features like that. Um, the homeowners absolutely appreciate that. They, they take complete pride in, in, this, in this element now because it's unique. How many of us can say that we have an 18th century uh, chimney in our backyard? Yeah. <laughs> While Shane and his crew work on one sustainable home here in Derry, we might wonder, what's next? And when people uh, you know, really start to change the, how, they, how they think about homes is, is, is when we're going to start seeing the, the innovation come about when the costs come down and whatnot. That's, and that, that's the big thing we're waiting for. You know, the ideas are there. You know, the, 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 all, the gra all the framework is there. It's just a matter of executing and allowing builders, the, you know, the trade groups, vendors all kind of come together and that's when we're going to see you know the the half million dollar house and under being able to be available for everybody you know as far as being energy efficient being able to use reclaimed resources being able to use um, uh, uh, you know recycled lumber is being able to use energy efficient building practices and to have that cost be available to everybody and that's I, I think that's going to be the next the next thing to see. but we're also working on our own parcels of land uh, for future development in the, in the coming years where we can implement some of our land development uh, goals and strategies to create more engaged communities, to create communities that are, that are much more focused on uh, agriculture and, uh, and truly being sustainable as a development itself, not just sustainable in the individual home we build or, uh, or, or in the individual feature of a home, but sort of taking a step back from that and hopefully creating a sustainability on a, on a larger level as well. Cool. From sustainable homes to sustainable communities, that sounds like a solution worth working towards. We'll be right back. Before the break, we looked at solutions to create sustainable homes. We can always improve the efficiency of existing homes, and we can build near zero waste homes from the ground up. But no matter how little energy our homes consume, there's always going to be waste of a different sort. I'm talking garbage. Our final solution comes from Ryan Bedard of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Inspired by composting laws in San Francisco, Ryan formed a company called Eco Movement in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Eco Movement specializes in composting. It's a solution that can save our landfills a lot of waste. And for businesses, it's a solution that can definitely reduce the amount of trash all the way each week. Last week, Ryan let us ride along on one of his newly introduced residential composting pickup runs. So today we're going to have a uh, pickup for about seven residents. Um, we just started the program this last month and it's still growing. So one of our newest clients uh, will be delivering a bin and that includes one of these compostable liners. We always give some flyers to pass out to other neighbors. And we give a list of what can and can't go in the compost. As well as our own sticker to put on their, their vehicle. So we'll be dropping this bin off this morning. We have another resident uh, who had a smaller bin, so we'll be swapping out her bin for a bigger one. And we'll be picking up some food waste on the way. 
According to the Environmental Protection Agency, the United States generates more than 34 million tons of food waste each year, and less than 3% of that waste is recycled. So Ryan Bedard just might be on to something with this residential composting pickup service. I'm hoping it can open the door to thinking about consumption and, uh, you know, sustainability in a whole, and how wasteful we are as a society. So. Ryan's company, Eco Movement, not only educates clients on waste reduction and composting, they'll actually pick up compostables so clients don't have to maintain a compost bed of their own. I, I often feel like uh, I'm the milkman that, you know, someone's going to come out and see the bin and, and just get a smile on their face because they, you know, they get to start diverting their food waste from a landfill and so it's, it makes me feel good whenever I drop off a new bin. So what kinds of things are compostable? It's a lot of vegetation. It's good to check too to see if we got any contamination. See this is a, a good example of something you know a lot of people go to uh, takeout restaurants um, and they'll get these compostable containers and then they don't know what to do with them so a lot of times it just ends up in the landfill and so we can take this stuff and we can take all the corn based stuff and compost it because at a commercial facility the heats are hot enough to activate the resins in those things whereas your backyard compost you don't get those heats necessary to do it so it's cool to see that in there looks like you got some fruits and veggies in there too composting is not you know there's a lot of logistics involved it's not super easy to do that so you know we're just getting the start on it and hopefully it'll take off Apartment complexes is one of the reasons why we wanted to offer the service too, is because you have people that live in apartment complexes and either have no yard or if they have a yard, it's very little and it's shared. I think it's just like, you know, getting home heating oil that's biofuel or, you know, driving a diesel or a hybrid or something. You know, it's kind of people get really excited about it and they feel empowered because, you know, you can't do everything, but for a long, you know, time I've always said, you know, Closing the loop one small step at a time, you know, taking one small step each day because that adds up. It's going great. It's going great. It's really reducing my garbage. I take one bag to the dump every two weeks. Um, it's, uh, it reduces the food smell in the house. I feel like I'm really doing something that's important Excellent. and meaningful. These are compostable, by the way. You know, I'm not going to stop what I'm doing, and a lot of other companies that are doing what they're doing aren't doing it to make money. They do it because they truly believe that what they're doing is making change, and so you know, putting that positive energy out there still will have uh, a positive impact. And I think the more people that do it, the more change we'll see. And so my hope is that people realize that they have an effect sooner than, than later. And that's, that's our goal with, you know, this company is to raise that level of awareness so people will become educated and, and have the knowledge to make the change that needs to happen. So that'll do us for this week on The Green Screen. Join us next week for more solutions.